All right, so we want to pick up where we left off, try and narrow the, the gap on this thing. We want to open it up for question and answers if anyone's been having some things that have been uh, presented here this weekend that they want to ask some questions on. I can guarantee if you have a question on any of it, somebody else is going to have the same question. So we need not feel like we're putting ourselves on the spot if we have a question. We want to, we're all friends here, brothers and sisters, and we want to feel, feel free that we can express that. So I want to invite that a little bit later on. And then I think after that, we're going to go out and enjoy a fire. We've got some really nice weather. It really turned nice this evening. It's actually almost, you could call, warm out there. So we were talking about Daniel 7, and I don't want to start getting into Daniel 7 other than make the point that Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 are parallel prophecies. They're telling the same story, and I picked up on a couple of obvious things. When these eagle's wings were repped off, what did they represent? I believe the United States, the same thing as a notable horn that leads the charge against Islam. It's interesting that Daniel 8 contains the war, but Daniel 7 doesn't. But Daniel picks it up where the dividing of the kingdoms and the ripping off of the eagle's wings. So we get the preview or the prelude in Daniel chapter 8 that shows us what starts the downward spiral of this world and enters us into the time, the appointed time of the end. And so it's the war with Islam, and it's interesting that it's the three brothers that are warring. We've got two brothers in the son's of Isaac as one of the brothers. We've got those of the house of Israel today, which I would include as Christians, so to speak, that claim to be of the son of Yeshua, because you believe, same as I do, if you're of Yeshua, then you're of Abraham's seed. So those two are going to join forces against the other brother, against the Ishmaelites, and they're going to have war and they're going to square off because one believes they should rule the world and the other one does as well. So that's where the conflict really comes from. It's a 4,000-year-old conflict that's going to end in the destruction of the uh, Ishme Ishmaelites. And that battle's been raging for a long time. It was the Ishmaelites that actually sold Joseph as a slave into Egypt, and that was a fate worse than death. And so uh, basically it was a death sentence for their cousin is really, they weren't too far from uh, their father, Abraham, at that point. So here we have a, a prophecy that parallels Daniel chapter 8. So we get a little more information. We see here that the eagle's wings are ripped off. And then the rest of the prophecy really starts dealing with what happens after that, as well as Daniel 8 as well. Both of these prophecies end up with a power called the little horn that is responsible for persecuting God's people. So that's a direct link. Now we can take this because we have a lion with, an eagle, with eagle's wings, but the eagle's wings are ripped off. So we no longer have a lion with eagle's wings. We just have a lion. We also have a bear as the second beast. And we have a third beast in a leopard. And then we have the fourth beast that it says is dreadful and terrible. And it's, it has ten horns on its head. And then that's where the little horn comes from. And so these are these four major kingdoms of the world. And we've identified two of them. We're not going to get into the details. But the lion, I think, is pretty obvious, is Great Britain. And the bear is Russia. And it's interesting, in the prophecy, it says to the bear, somebody said to the bear, they said unto it, arise and devour much flesh. Do you think the bear is capable of arising and devouring much flesh? Are we seeing a preview to the possibilities of that? As soon as the United States goes down and is no longer the number one power in the world, what do you suppose Russia will do? Whatever it wants. There will be nothing to stop it because Europe can't stop it if Russia decides to do something. The only thing that holds Russia in check right now, in reality, is the United States. Now, the next beast here is a leopard. That's the third beast. Now, that's a little bit confusing, but a process of elimination, if it's dealing with the, the strongest beast in the world, and it's a leopard-like beast, 
it would probably by default have to fall on China. It's interesting that it says of the third beast that it gets dominion. So dominion is taken away from the first beast, the notable horn. So who do you think would rule the world? Who would be the number one superpower in the world if the United States went down? Sure, and the prophecy says that dominion is given to the third beast. And of course, the fourth beast is met, made up of many kingdoms, and that's where the little horn comes. I believe that the fourth beast would have to be the European Union. Now, there's a problem, a slight problem with that, because the UN is made up of these four nations. So you have Great Britain, you have the, the China and Russia, but the next one is France. They're the, also the permanent members. So how does France fit into this? Well, France probably, most likely, we'll have to wait and see, will represent the European Union uh, as far as that goes. So that, that seat that France has will very likely be turned into a European Union seat. And that looks to be the way it's being structured even today. That seems to be where we're going. So this is a multinational beast, this fourth beast, and I believe that to be the European Union. And that's where the little horn comes from. We know that from the prophecy. It comes out of that power. And we can see that as we go through and figure out who the little horn is, that he will come from Europe. When we take that prophecy, we see all the different kingdoms, then we transport that into the book of Revelation, and we, something, we see something extremely interesting. We see another beast in Revelation 13, and it happens to be made up of the same four beasts that we see in the book of Daniel. So if you've got four beasts that are representing the United Nations in the world, and we're going to a one world order, wouldn't it be appropriate in Revelation 13 to see all the beasts on all those different four beasts in one? This is exactly what we see in Revelation 13. It says, I saw a beast with seven heads. That's exactly that fourth beast that it talks about in, in Daniel chapter 7. And it, see, it says that the body is like a leopard, and it has feet like a bear, and it has mouth like a lion. I don't think out of all the animals that it's a coincidence that we have exactly the same animals represented in Revelation 13, except they're not operating as one, or they're in Daniel 7, but in Revelation 13, they're operating as one. So what is that telling us? They came together as? Well, not quite. A new world order. Because the United States has been broken off, Canada has been broken off. These are the, the on the European, if you will, landmass, all the, the eastern landmass. These are a unification of that landmass. In Revelation chapter 13, later on in the Revelation chapter 13, there's a second beast that arises out of the earth in a different location. This one arises out of the sea, the sea of people. See of different languages and nations and tongues, but there's another beast that arises out of the earth. We're not going to get into that, but that's where the United States and I believe Canada will join together and rise up out of the ashes, so to speak, and they will join. It says they will make an image to the beast. In other words, what it's saying here is this beast power creates a system that if you want to pay, or if you want to play, you've got to pay. You've got to bow down to our system, and the, this system will work together as a new world order. Not a one world order yet, until we have the second beast. It says of the second beast that it makes an image to the beast. Now, what's an image? What is an image? When you look in the mirror, you see an image of what? Is it you? No, but it looks an awful lot like you, right? So if there's a system of worship in place and a system of government to make an image to that system, what would it have to look like? It'd have to be the same system, wouldn't it? So this second beast that arises out of a different area of the earth, if they want to play, they have to pay. That's the way the system is. So they will have to create a system that duplicates the system of this power, this, this new world order power. So that's when it becomes a one world order. 
everyone at that time will be under a one world system. So the Bible, very interesting, shows the steps of exactly how that happens. Now we see in the world today that there's a system being created and, and most Christians and a lot of Messianic people are paranoid that this 2030 agenda is going to come to pass. And I so, know some people that speak on it and write on it and all of this, but if we follow the biblical pattern that's laid down, this system that's being created right now is actually a counterfeit of the counterfeit. It's to get people off track looking over here when everything's going on back here. You see, Satan's no fool. He's got it figured out. He's got everyone thinking that this is the new world order and everyone's focused on that. But really, the new world order is coming up from behind them. It's called a conservative Christian movement. That's where the new world order is going to come. That's what's happening right now in the world today. If you want to tune in to some of the right wing, if you will, news sites, you're going to find out. These guys are all Christian. You want to call them nationalists? Whatever you want to call them. It's a worldwide movement. And they are not going to put up with this 2030 agenda. They're not. They're very serious people. And this is what we're seeing in the United States. This is what we're seeing in Canada. You guys do realize we're going to have a change in government in Canada in the next election. Now, what do you suppose the government is going to be? It's going to be a conservative government. Government People are sick and tired of being told what to do, and they didn't vote for any of this stuff that's going on, and they're going to vote this one out. The same thing is happening in the States. The same thing is happening all over the world is people are waking up and they don't want any part of what's going on. And they're going to rise up against it. And guess what? The Christians are all over this because they're basically conservative. And you don't notice it as much here in Canada, but you really notice it in the States. They are really Christians and they are conservative Christians nationalists, patriots, and they are armed to the teeth. They are. They believe that's part of that system. They have a right to defend themselves. And if we actually do a little homework in the Torah, the Torah actually gives, gave God's people a right to defend themselves. And we can see that as we look through the Torah. So there's, there's this concept Christians are battling with, well, do we have a right? to bear arms and all of this. This is a study that I find that's going on in a lot of Christian circles. We're trying to figure that out. It's kind of an interesting topic. And uh, we won't get into that now because we might all start fighting about it. We don't want to do that. But it's, it's something to consider because we realize we're facing the enemy right in front of us. So we're going to see this movement come to pass and we're going to see this new world order in the Bible step by step takes it through on how it's going to happen. So we can see that war is coming. That's the very first event that we're looking at. But we're also going to have in, in the interim, we could get ourselves into trouble with some civil unrest. And the Bible is clear that civil unrest will be part of the first uh, movements in these birth pains. We also see in Revelation chapter uh, 17 that there's a beast that, or that there's a harlot that rides this beast. In other words, the harlot gets control of the whole world. This is exactly what we see in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8. Instead of being called a little horn as it is in Daniel, it turns into a harlot in Revelation 17. So are you aware that God called Israel a harlot at times in the Old Testament? So let's just, let's just think about this for a moment. If God did away with Israel proper, and what Yeshua said actually said that your house is left under your desolate, and he will take the kingdom of God and give it to, to another nation. We talked about that uh, a meeting or so ago. So if that's really true, where did the kingdom of God end up? We don't often think of it in these terms. 
But if the kingdom of God was taken from the bloodline of the house of Israel and given to the true house of Israel, God's people, those that accepted him and were grafted into the tree, where did it end up? I know you don't often think in these terms, but as Paul and Peter and the likes traveled throughout the Middle East sharing the gospel, where did it gain a foothold and that area took control of the Christian church? Britain, I heard. Did I hear Rome? Yes, absolutely. Rome took control. Now people say, well, Rome is a fallen church, and some people think it's the harlot or the little horn, which I do. But when we actually analyze what happened, is the church of Rome was actually a pure church when it started. When Paul and Peter, they set up the Roman church. But slowly through the centuries, it went the wrong direction. It did exactly the same thing that Israel did of old. You see, history keeps repeating itself. But in its infancy, it was a pure church. They were keeping the feasts. They were doing all these things. It's very clear that the Asian church was keeping the feasts. Corinth, Philippi, and all through, even to Rome. Paul and Peter were teaching them that they needed to adhere to these ancient customs that the, the um, Israelite people were doing. And they were doing it. History bears out that they were doing it. And so the church was pure. So if that's where the headquarters of the New Testament church really got a foothold, then if it went the wrong way, the same direction as Israel, is it possible that it could turn into a harlot? If God called ancient Israel a harlot when they fell into apostasy, is it possible that he's telling us the same thing in the book of Revelation? The Roman church in its infancy was a pure church, but it fell over time, and at the end of time, he calls it a harlot. You don't want to rule out that possibility. The harlot is going to gain control of the whole world. And I used to... I used to do some little interesting things with some of the students at school because they, they kind of were interested in New World Order concepts. And I was surprised they were actually talking about this. And I'd sit down with them and start asking them some questions. And they were saying, you know, do you think there will ever be real world peace and all of this? I, I was surprised they were even concerned about it. But they, uh, I would get them into a conversation and I would kind of lead them along. And one of the questions I would get to is, if there was a world leader in the world that could bring world peace, who do you think it would be? I think I heard the Pope. Did somebody? Yeah. That's where they would end up. When I, do you think Putin would bring in it? No, not Putin. How about Prince Charles? Ah, uh, no, not Prince Charles. And, and they would get to, and they would, they would end up at the Pope. You see, the world, if brought to its knees, recognizes the Pope. Even the Protestants have forgotten what the word Protestant means. Protesting something, protesting the Catholic Church. That wall has been broken down, and they basically have become one. So you've got the population of the world, which is pretty much half, Christianity, gaining control of the whole world, and this will be the state-approved religion. They will change times and laws of all the nations, so you will not be able to keep any holy days or holidays other than the state-approved days. And this is where we're going. This is what the Bible teaches. They will change times and laws. And we see in history where that has already happened. It just hasn't been enforced to the whole world. Tells us here of this little horn, and out of them, that's one of the four horns that were on this goat, where it says the main horn or the notable horn was broken, then four came up out of these four great nations, and it says, out of one of them came a little horn which grew ceiling great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Here again, 
we have some ink on paper. All these things are very important. So I've got slides on another presentation where I go through all the details on this. But if you go to Rome and you go south, where do you hit, what do you hit? The Mediterranean, of course, but you hit North Africa. Now, then it says you go east. So if you go to North Africa and then you go east, you're going off the top part of Africa. Why do you suppose the Catholic Church, if it is the Catholic Church, would go south and then east? Do you know that's the area called the 1040 window? That's the highest density population in the world. And that contains Muslims and also Hinduism, uh, Confucius and all that through China. So it says that there's basically what's going to happen here is the Christian church is going to go south, headquartered in Rome, then it's going to go east, and it will convert the whole world to its system. And the Catholic Church is pretty unique in that area because you can go to different lands that are Roman Catholic, and they all have their little customs, and they're all quite different. Some places in the Philippines, I understand at Easter time, they actually pin people to crosses with nails and all kinds of things, which we think is ridiculous, but they get away with it because they're doing in the name of Catholicism. And they're just a little bit radical. So Catholicism, they don't mind, really, they don't mind what you do as long as you recognize them as the top uh, religion. And that's the way it's going to work. That's the way it will be set up. As long as everyone pays homage to the papal system, they will be able to operate in their areas. So we see directions here, which are very important. And then what does it say? What's the last direction? Where's that? Exactly. All the prophecies point to the time of the end. Jerusalem is going to be the focal point. Is there anything in, on this planet right now that would suggest that Jerusalem's going to be the focal point? Jerusalem is the focal point. It's now the focal point. It will become the focal point. And the Catholic Church will move their headquarters, their seat of authority, to Jerusalem. Why would they do that? As representatives of the city, they would be the ambassadors for what? For who? Who do they claim to represent? They claim to represent Yeshua, their Jesus, their king. And, they, and Yeshua himself said, this is the city of the great king. If Catholicism gets control of this world, what better place would they rule from than Jerusalem? It all kind of makes sense. They've had their eyes on Jerusalem for a long, long time. The Crusades... You guys remember that? They tried to push, push the Muslims out of there and gain control. And it flipped back and forth over thousands of years to try and get control of Jerusalem. And that's what this whole thing is about. Even today in the news, what's the issue? It's old Jerusalem. And that's where the three main religions of the world have uh, have places of worship in that place. Ultimately, it's going to be one of those religions that gains control, and it will be Catholicism being the lead on that, but Protestants will honor that as well. And so we're going to have this happen. This power will end up in Jerusalem, exactly what Yeshua said. So the ram represents, the ram with two horns represents, in the prophecy, it tells us, it says the ram with two horns, the two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. So it's interesting how God works. He didn't tell Daniel that the ram represents Iraq, Iran, Syria. Why wouldn't he do that? Would that have made any sense to Daniel at all? No. He might have got Syria and put that together with Assyria, but when when the countries as we know them today, they weren't known to the ancient Bible writers. And so God gave us to them in the names that the prophet would have understood back then. So we, in our days of intelligence and the information that we have, we just need to go to some ancient uh, history books 
and find out where the Asia or where the Medo-Persia Empire was back in Daniel's day. This is in, around 500 BC. This is the Persian, the Medo-Persian Empire at its strength. So this is the area that it covered. Now this area here went up and actually went into Macedonia a little bit. So this is Turkey here, Armenia, down into, these are the southern Russian republics, the Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, all those, which are all Muslim nations. And it goes through, this is the area of Afghanistan, Pakistan, goes into Persia proper, which is Iran, Iraq, and Syria, across over to Egypt, and took in the northern part of Saudi Arabia. The reason why it didn't take in all of Saudi Arabia is because it was primarily desert back then. But uh, today, of course, there's uh, lots of life in Saudi Arabia because of the, the uh, funds that the Saudis have, and they have built cities uh, in a number of places. So these are the areas back then. So if these prophecies, three times in this prophecy, it tells us that this is a war that's going to happen in the time of the end and involves the kings of Media and Persia, all we need to do is figure out what is going on today. And we can see here something additionally imp uh, important is this is the area of the Medes and the Persians, but this is the area where most of the Muslims are situated. So now in the prophecy, we saw something. Ram pushes west, pushes north. So now we go over here in Asia, the largest uh, Muslim population in the world, 250 million, I believe, something like that. They're pushing north, and they're pushing south. Now you see how all the world is involved. They're pushing in every direction that they are. And so the Muslim population, it's going to be go time, and they're going to go into all the world, which is exactly, they're actually getting in place now. These people, all they've ever known throughout their whole history is war. They're experts at war. That's why Russia couldn't defeat a little country like Afghanistan, and Russia couldn't take them on. The United States couldn't defeat them because they hide in the caves and in the mountains, and you just can't root them out. These people know how to do it. And so they will move throughout the world, which we see that happening right now. So in Daniel's time, the kings of Media Persia, if we were to draw a map, and this is what I found very interesting, if we were to take this line and overlay it on a map today, it's exactly the same countries as the main Muslim nations today in the Middle East. Now, it seems interesting that those are the kings of Media and Persia, which represent the horns, not the beast itself, not the ram itself proper, but those are the horns. And that's kind of interesting because Saudi Arabia is the most powerful country in the East, and every Muslim during their lifetime has to go to Mecca and pay homage there. It's a requirement in Islam. They actually control all of Islam in, in Saudi Arabia, and the other Middle East countries don't like it that much, and they are always disputing on who should have rights. Right now, you have to, I understand, get a Saudi passport or a passport to be able to go into there, but they believe that you shouldn't have to have a passport to get to Mecca and those holy sites because they should be available to all Muslims without having to go through the consulate in Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia controls this. They're the most powerful nation. And, uh, and that's why the horns, the kings of Media and Persia, in their height, took in all of this area. So you've got Afghanistan, Pakistan, all these Tur uh, Turkmenistan and, and uh, those other Russian republics that have broken away. Of course, you've got Israel right in the center and in Luke, it says something very interesting. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, are we seeing that today? Yeah. We're seeing everything being set up. And all of this stuff right now, it's just preview. It's not the main event. It's just getting us ready so that we can see that the main event is on the horizon. Because we want to know, like in Luke, it says, when are these things about to take place? 
So God in his mercy has shown us when these things are about to take place. So we're just getting warmed up. So the kings of Media and Persia are the, the Arab and Persian nations that will come together as one union. Now, in, uh, in Daniel chapter, uh, chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 10, it gives us two geographical fixes. It says that he was by the river Uli, and he was also in Daniel 10 by the Tigris. Well, it's interesting that the Uli River in Persia flows into southern Iraq, and it joins up with the uh, river Tigris in, in Iraq, in southern Iraq, in, in Kuwait, down at the Persian Gulf. So what God has done, instead of giving us a, a GPS, he's given us the two rivers where they dissect. And that's where Daniel, it seems, was transported to see the vision. Now that's kind of an, of an interesting spot there. So that's exactly where he would have been in southern Iraq, where the Uli River comes together and dissects this, comes together with the Tigris, and the Euphrates is just to the, to the west of that and they join together just at the Persian Gulf. So what that is telling me, I think, is that this is central. This is ground zero, where Daniel could kind of just go like this and see the vision, the war, this great war unfold. Now, when we look at that again, we can see that that's exactly the way it is. Right where he was now, is right in the center of the kings of the Media and Persia. So Daniel was at center stage watching this war uh, unfold. In Daniel chapter 10, it says of this war that Daniel fell sick for three weeks. Now, have you ever seen something that scared you so much that you fell sick for three weeks? This is the experience that Daniel had when he saw this great conflict that it says that he felt sick for three weeks. There's another interesting spot in that area. This is the Strait of Hormuz. Anywhere from 25 to 30% of the world's oil flows through that little tiny spot. I believe it's like 20 miles wide. And uh, we get a lot of oil out of there. It's interesting why we do, but the world gets a lot of oil out of there. If this is shut down, do you think there will be an oil shortage? Oh, yeah. There will be, fuel will be rationed. Here in Canada, I'm not sure how we're going to do. I'm not sure what's going to happen. But fuel is going to be rationed through this time. I tell people to make sure your tank is always on the top half instead of the bottom half. It might be a good idea. It might be a good idea to start thinking that maybe I should have some kind of fuel reserve in case there's a small emergency that happens, a little interruption in the fuel supply. With what's going on in the United States right now, with the civil, the possible civil unrest, which I believe is going to happen quite soon, is that we could have some interruptions. In fact, I was asking I, a question that I asked people. They've had about, I don't know if I asked this group or not, because it seems to be a common question on my mind, because I find it kind of interesting. Estimate anywhere between 10 to 20 million, I've heard a number the other day, 21 million, that have come up through the southern border. And they have found that a lot of people gone into the states have come in from Canada. Have you guys heard that? They're coming in through Ontario and New Brunswick, and, and they're getting across there as well. The multitudes have come up from the south, from anywhere around 150 different countries, and a lot of those are enemies. So if... I'm going to rephrase that. When Donald Trump gets in power, what has he said he's going to do to those people? He's going to send them all back. And they're going to file, and they're going to get on buses, and they're going to go back, right? No. They're not going to go back. They're going to fight back because they haven't come here to go back anywhere. They've come here to fight, a lot of them. And they've come here to throw us into chaos and change the whole system. That's why they're here. They've come from China. They've come from uh, nations in the Middle East and Venezuela and all these countries that are actually our enemies in reality. And they've come there, and they are not going back to where they came from. 
it seems, and I've heard this, and it seems logical that some of them have come from prisons. And some of them are pretty bad guys. And so there's been deals made with the governments. If you get out of our country, we will release you from prison. Now, would that help those countries to be able to do that? Would it help countries like Venezuela, El Salvador, to empty their prisons as long as they had a guarantee that those people would leave the countries? Absolutely, it benefits. Donald Trump, I heard him say the other day, I would do the same thing. If other countries are going to take their prisoners, which cost them millions of dollars, send them out. Where have they come? They've come to the United States. And a lot of these people are just no good people. Doesn't mean they all are like that, but it does mean that some of them are going to raise some problems, which they already have. So those people have not come just so they can put on a bus or a plane to go back home because they're not going to be welcome back home for the most part. They've come here for a purpose. So they're not going to go home. So where do you suppose they're going to go? If the United States government under the presidency of Donald Trump is going to round them all up and they're not going to be welcome in the United States, are, there, are they going to go back home? So, what? They wouldn't. They're coming north. They're going to come north. So how do you suppose that's going to work out? You know why they're going to come north? Because we have a prime minister that's insane. And they know that. And they think they're going to have refuge in Canada. And so we're going to welcome them here in Canada. So all those that have come up through the southern border will be distributed all over North America. And so this is how it's going to play out. And once they're in position, it will be go time. And that's why the United States government that will be led by Donald Trump will team up with Israel and will lead the West to destroy Islam because they will finally realize what all their plans are coming to fruition. And they will have to do exactly what the prophecy says and trample this thing, break its two horns. And it says there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Now, that means that there may be other countries that try to, but they cannot. That's what it says. So when we read the details, we can see the enormity of this thing. So it tells us that these are the kings of Media and Persia. What does it tell us about the goat? It says of the goat, and I would propose that the goat is actually the UN that's led by the West, the Western nations, which are primarily conservative Christian will be at that time. And it says here, and the rough goat is the king of Grecia. Different translations will bring this out. Uh, the king of Grecia. That's led many Bible theologians to believe that, that this is talking about Alexander the Great. But we have three times in the prophecy that it says this is a vision for the time of the end. Alexander does not fit the time frame, the time context of the vision. But if we take a closer look at the word Grecia, it's actually not Grecia, it's Javan. So now if we do what we need to do when we're looking at prophetic insights, we have to go back to figure out what is Javan. I want you to turn to your Bibles in, in Genesis chapter 10. You see, Javan goes a way back, way past Alexander the Great. And it's interesting, there's, we don't have to guess about this. Javan was the son of Japheth. Who was Japheth? Anyone remember who Japheth was? He was Noah's son. So Javan was the son, sort of the grandson of Noah. It tells us here something interesting. In Genesis chapter 10, verse 4, it says, The sons of Javan were Elisha, Tarsus, Kittim, and Donanin. From these, from these sons of Javan, these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands 
everyone according to his own language, according to the families, into their nations. So Javan is actually the Gentile nations. So when we actually figure it out, we figure out who they were. They were the people that went west. In through the Mediterranean, they habit, inhabited Europe. And then those people, the descendants of those people, they came to North America. So at the end, we're told, not Grecia, but we're told that the people of Javan, the descendants of Javan, who are the Western nations primarily, go to war against the Ishmaelites or the people of, of Islam. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king or the king of prominence, the notable horn. So we see here at the end, the people of the West that went that direction, there's going to be a mighty king. We're going to see this verse here in a moment. There's going to be a mighty king that leads the charge against Islam. So now in verse 22, following on the heels, as for the broken horn, that's the, the king that leads the charge, and the four horns that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation. So that's these four beasts from Daniel 7, the four horns. This is all talking about that. So out of when the large horn is broken, the United States is broken, these four nations, these four permanent members of the Security Council take control of the world, and they create a new world system without the United States because those wings have been ripped off. We get a little more information in Daniel chapter 11. Uh, so in Daniel chapter 11, it gives us a little more information. That's why we need more data to get more information. It tells us in Daniel chapter 8 that there are two horns, two powers, the kings of Media and Persia. Now we get some more detail on these kings of Media and Persia. It says here about the vision, he says, Now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and a force shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all, all of what? All of the ram, which is Islam, against the realm of Greece or Grecia, whatever translation you have. We have a group that we meet with from France, and in the French Bible, it actually says Javan. No confusion in that one. So they have actually put the right word in there. And when I gave that explanation, that, that makes a lot more sense. It's not talking about Alexander the Great. It's talking about the nations that went west through the Mediterranean and inhabited uh, Europe and then ultimately in North America. So here it tells us why the kings of Medo-Persia become great. Because different nations of the Medo-Persian Empire in the time of the end are going to join together. You see, this is why America has been first and foremost to try and divide the two sects of Islam. The Shiite and the Sunni sect, they've tried to keep them apart because the worst nightmare for the West is if they unite. Because people in the know know what their plans are. And so we, if we have a unified front in Islam, they know what they will do. And this is exactly what they're going to do. The prophecy says they're going to unite. How are they going to unite? This is something that we're watching very close. When Saudi Arabia, the richest and most powerful nation, pulls everything together because they are the most powerful Muslim nation, it says that through this power, by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all of Islam against the Grecian power, which is Javan, the West. So watch Saudi Arabia, um, and we can see what's going on. So Saudi Arabia there is, is very close to ground zero here. We want to look at some possibilities. It tells us that these more kings will be added. I would suggest Iran will fit into that one pretty well. Another kingdom that would work for there is Iraq. The United States has lost a lot of power and uh, stance in Iraq, and it's slowly going more Islamic because two-thirds of the population of Iraq is actually Shia Muslim. It's not just strictly 
Uh, Sunni is Shia, and it's tied, a lot of the people are tied to Iran. So Iran has a lot of effect on what happens in Iraq. Syria, of course, uh, would ally itself with the Muslim nations very easily. And Saudi Arabia, I believe, would be that fourth nation. Once Saudi Arabia goes with this movement to go against the West, then all of Islam will join forces and, and go with it. And that's when everything will break loose. Then it says in Daniel chapter 11, right after what we just read, three more kings will arise in Persia, it gives us another little insight into here. It says when this happens, when they start to join forces, a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. Now, if there was, and I know there's lots of different thoughts in that on this, and, and I appreciate that, and we have lots of different ideas, but if there was a, a, a possible mighty king that would arise at this time, and he would be actually another name for the notable horn, is it possible that this mighty king could be represented in Donald Trump. I believe that this mighty king is the one that leads the charge. It's the one that was broken in Daniel chapter 8. It's the eagle's wing that was broken in chapter 7. So we can see here, because this is a repeat chapter, it's in the same context of the war with the kings of Media and Persia. So there's going to be a notable horn that has is represented by also eagle's wings. And here it says, it's a mighty king shall arise and rule with great dominion. So when Donald Trump is trumpeting, how come you're not laughing? <laughs> when he's spouting off and he's saying he's going to make America great again and more powerful than it's ever been, that actually squares with prophecy. That's exactly what the prophecy said. And so we just have to wait and see if this is going to come to fruition. I would propose that within about two and a half weeks, we're going to know if this prophecy is going to come to pass. And that's what I love about this, because we're all going to find out if we're on track at all. It says here, when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up. This is the same word used back in Daniel chapter 8, where the large horn is broken. So this is a parallel prophecy speaking about the notable horn, speaking about the eagle's wings. This mighty king is going to be broken. This mighty king, it's going to be short-lived in the White House. It's not going to last very long. And I've got my own reasons of why that's going to happen, but it gives us some more detail about what that means. It says, but not, it says, and, and toward Sorry, it will be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven. This is also a reference from Daniel 8, where it says four kingdoms will come up from the four winds of heaven. So we see here some direct links that we can go from Daniel 7, because these four beasts, it says, when the four winds are striving on the great sea. The great sea of what? The great sea of people in the world. So we can see these connecting dots all the way through. So it says, it goes on to say this division, so we have the four winds represented, these four beasts come up again, but not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled. Now this is very interesting here. We get a little more information here. So the United States, I believe, through the prophecies, is going to become greater than it's ever been. It will dominate the world. It will bring world peace after the war. It will be the main uh, mover in this war, they will defeat the Muslims, and it will be an apparent victory. But because of the fallout of the war, the United States is going to be broken and cut out of the new world system. So we, we will be reduced to a third world nation. And contrary to popular belief, uh, J.D. Vance has been set up to take over from Donald Trump in the second term. But it says here that they're going to lose their position in the world. And it says their authority will be not divided among those in their national, in their nationality. 
it's going to be given to others besides these. So Donald Jr. is not going to take Donald Trump Sr.'s job. That's what it says here, very clear. Not among his posterity, those are his sons, nor according to his dominion. So J.D. Vance is not going to rise to the power and be the number one power in the, super, in the uh, United States. He's not going to take Donald Trump's position of authority and rule over the same dominion that Donald Trump did, being the number one superpower in the world. We're going to be reduced, according to the prophecy, uh, and we won't have a place in uh, the world dominion at that time. And the world will move forward without the United States. Has anyone heard that the U.S. dollar may not be the world currency pretty soon? This is exactly what this is indicating. The United States is going down as a nation, which means Canada will follow on its heels. For his kingdom, his authority, his power, his number one position shall be uprooted even for others besides these. So the other kingdoms, the other four notable horns or the other four beasts are going to rise and take the authority that the number one beast has. That's exactly what the prophecies are telling us. So the Medo-Persian Empire today, it's very interesting. Does anyone remember Desert Storm? We want to wind up here in a few minutes, so we'll uh, wind up. Anyone remember De Desert Storm? back in the 90s, I believe, when they went into Iraq and Kuwait. and They came up from the south. So they came into that area from the south through the Arabian Sea and up through into the Persian Gulf, and that's where they staged the war, a little bit in the Mediterranean, but mostly it was from here. If the Muslims all join up, now look at the geography here. If you've got Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and all these forces join power, is it going to be possible for them to come up here and stage a war from that position? Always when there's a war that's staged in another country, they go to the closest ally. They will not. If, if Islam joins up, there are no allies in that area. It would be a death trap going into the Persian Gulf. They would be completely destroyed. So what the prophecy says, actually, the prophecy says that Daniel seemed to be, see this power from the west that came across the surface of the whole earth. So it's interesting, the border of Islam is actually right there, right next to Greece. Where do you suppose that most of the forces are going to be staked from? Greece the direction of the sons of Javan. They will come from the west across the surface of the whole earth, and they're going to land right here. And that's where the staging is going to be from. Italy will be involved. All these nations will be involved, involved but it's primarily the sons of Javan. So this is what we have in this war that's shaping up as we go. So Greece will actually be a staging point. So it kind of works in a way because Javan and Greece are part of the same people groups that went west and inhabited the islands. Uh, and there's just a multitude of islands in that area. And they slowly moved west across the Mediterranean up into Europe and so on. So that's the direction that they're going to be going from. And of course, they come from the west and uh, they make war with this group of people.